Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation of these United States of America, as was founded in 1789 by George Washington and other white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Calvinists. Remembering, according to George Bancroft in his masterpiece work, his ten-volume set that the of the history of the United States, he said in about volume three that every state was Protestant, including Maryland. Okay. So um, the purpose of the Jesuit order was in fulfilling the Council of Trent is to destroy the Protestant Reformation worldwide, and North America here became a haven for the white Northern European Protestants of Europe as they had been persecuted for over 200 years by the Jesuits and their Inquisition. And so they purposed to destroy it. They considered this a missionary country in 1808 and ended it in 1900 when they took the country with with uh, Teddy Roosevelt with the McKinley assassination. But throughout the 1800s, they were busy bringing in Irish Roman Catholics for the purpose of uh, settling them primarily in the cities of the north, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and other areas, so that they could uh, be given control of the political machine and the banking, and that ultimately then the Jesuits would foment the war between the states, and on the ruins of that, in 1868, the Irish Roman Catholics would be manning everything, and they later then created the Knights of Columbus to man the empire. So the Jesuits have always had a plan of Catholicizing our country. They then went on to attempt to Latinize our borders, and I read about this in Burke McCarty's great work, The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, uh, written in 1924, when she very plainly said that it was the purpose of the Jesuits to Catholicize our southern borders with Mexicans and people from uh, the Caribbean. And so that is what illegal immigration is really all about. It's bringing in millions and millions of Mexican Roman Catholics that will be the abject servants and slaves of the priests that protect them when they come in here. Because remember, many of them are employed by corporations, and those corporations are owned by the Vatican. Now, you said something about um, the Vatican hating us. And, it, you know, is it not true also that the monarchies of Europe also hated us because of what we did? Of course. The monarchies of Europe were under the control of the Vatican at the time of the Holy Alliance. Because if you remember, the Jesuit order used their French Revolution and Napoleon Bonaparte to chastise all the Roman Catholic kings of Europe, the Bourbons of France, the Bourbons of Spain, the Braganzas of Portugal, the Pope himself, for suppressing the Jesuit order in 1773 and thereabouts. So after that, uh, those Napoleonic Wars, when the Jesuits punished all their enemies with Napoleon, and by the way, the Jesuits have been expelled from all the French holdings, which included Illinois and Louisiana. And so the reason for the Louisiana Purchase, that Napoleon sold it off for $15 million to Jefferson, was so that the Jesuits would not have to be expelled from what was once French Catholic holdings. So they then, uh, with the monarchs of Europe, they then sided with the papacy with their holy alliance and dedicated to the destruction of our once Calvinistic Protestant Republic, which would include the British monarchy. Right. Um, to kind of speed up the timeline somewhat, uh, again, you have Luther's Reformation. And what did that do to the monarchies and also to the Vatican's hold? Well, the, the Protestant Reformation uh, gave the people the spiritual power to break away from not only the spiritual power of the Pope, that they did not need priests anymore, but all they needed was there was one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, so there was no need for the Pope or the priesthood. So they then carried on their revolutions in Germany with a 30 years war and in Holland with that 80 years war, to cease from being slaves of the papacy. And so it allowed the northern European, white northern European Anglo nations, Saxon nations, to break away from the Pope's political grip on them because also the kings and the nobles united with the people against the papacy. So that's what essentially happened. And then from then on, we understand history in Europe as the forces of the Counter-Reformation, the Jesuits, versus the forces of the Reformation particularly the Calvinists. 
And so we can assume also that the, uh, the monarchies were not happy with the United States because they gave the common person something they would not, and that is property. Is that correct? That's right. The monarchies hated the United States because it was an example to the world, which Benjamin Franklin, or which William Penn, pardon me, called the holy experiment. He said this was an example to the world that men could indeed truly govern themselves if indeed they were tempered with the teaching of the Bible, of the Reformation Bible. And so... Uh, all the other nations then sought to do the very same thing. I just finished a study on Benito Juarez, and Benito Juarez set up a constitutional republic in Mexico, and he is regarded as the savior of Mexico and the greatest Mexican statesman who has ever lived. And what Benito Juarez realized was that uh, the papacy had to go. So he expelled the Archbishop of Mexico. He expelled all five Roman bishops in that country. He kicked out all the Jesuits, all the secret societies, the Sisters of Charities, all of them. He forbade them to parade themselves in any religious garb. He forbade them to ring the bells. Benito Juarez brought wealth and beginning prosperity to Mexico. And so this so enraged the monarchs of Europe that England, France, and Spain invaded into Mexico over a supposed financial issue, but then uh, England and Spain withdrew, but France stayed because uh, Napoleon III was in charge of Maximilian there and wanted to extend the Holy Alliance into Mexico, which then uh, Lincoln, shortly after the war, said, you're not going to do that, assembled the federal troops on the border and told Maximilian to leave. Now, I uh, rather obliquely uh, alluded to um, a, a first immigration that involve Roman Catholics. And I would say this is not something that's anti-Roman Catholics, but rather engineered by the Vatican using Roman Catholics. But can you talk about the situation in Ireland, both the story that we get supposedly in our history books and the real deal with their um, leaving and immigrating to uh, the United States in the 19th century? Sure. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I'm descended from those people. My grandfather, Callahan, was an Irishman that came over from Ireland. Actually, his parents came over. His father was... Uh, very much Irish, and uh, they came over as a result of uh, this great exodus out of Ireland. Now, what caused this was not the potato famine. What caused this was the Jesuits were in control of the English monarchy since King George III. That is from about, what, uh, 1760 onward. So it didn't make any difference, if I could just interject this, that... Um, England had gone Anglican. That's just window dressing for. That's window dressing. Right. What the, the the important thing is the Jesuits controlled the court, and they controlled the Parliament through men like uh, 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 Viscount Palmerson and others. Remember, Viscount Palmerson was against those good Roman Catholic Italians who overthrew the temple power of the Pope in 1870 and were against the Italians when they revolted in 1849, Viscount Palmerston was against that. And he would not allow those Italians, when they fled to Malta, to stay there because it was a British holding. So the Roman Catholic British governor, governor of Malta kicked those Italian Roman Catholics off the island. So the whole British monarchy is controlled by the Vatican, by the, jet, by the Black Pope, no later than 1815. And so the Vatican then decides that their champions... Uh, with whom they are going to conquer North America will be the Irish. And so what they did in the 1840s, late 1840s, was they used Victoria and her prime minister to cause a huge, massive famine in Ireland. The, it is reported that eight ships left Ireland daily, loaded with Irish meats and vegetables to foreign ports, so as to purpose the forced starvation of nearly a million of my Irish brethren, and therefore driving the survivors out of Ireland into North America. So they actually had the stores, they had the crops, they had the meat. Absolutely. And it was, well, I guess forcibly uh, egressed out of Ireland to other places. Absolutely. We sent them off to foreign ports. Uh, not that you have to know this, I'm just curious. Uh, who's the prime minister with Victoria? That wasn't Israeli yet, was it? Disraeli was later, I believe okay. Palmerston was earlier. All right, that's right, Palmerston. But, but Disraeli was also involved. All right, now, with this forced immigration, that would necessarily mean, if you believe that there is a conspiracy, that uh, the Vatican had, and, and the monarchies as well, if they are joined at the hip, and I want you to speak to that, that they wanted to see um, an event that would take place some maybe two decades later or a decade later, 
that would start to uh, kneecap, if you will, the constitutional republic known as the United States. Right. What they then what they had planned was was they they had planned to foment a revolution, and all they had to do was read George Washington's farewell address, which is America's greatest state paper. And what he warned about was foreign influence that would cause a geographical division of the country, north and south, so as to foment a war, and thus the Constitution would fall. And he warned about that very strongly. So that's exactly what the Jesuits did. They brought their Irish Roman Catholics primarily into the northern cities. And then they taxed the southern people on their tobacco and cotton, and the tax that was collected was spent primarily on the development of northern industry, which really infuriated the southerners. And, of course, the vast majority of them were Protestants. Right. And also big states' rights advocates, right? Absolutely. And that's because the Constitution was a specific grant of powers. Nothing more than what was delineated in the Constitution was granted to the federal government by the states. All the other powers that were not specifically granted were retained by the states. And it's just like any other contract. If, if, you, I have, if you decide to have me build your house, and we enter into a contract, and I agree to buy these materials, and only these materials, what if I just decided to go buy all these other materials and then gave you the bill? See, there's no implied right. powers in, in the contract that you and I enter into, and there was no implied powers with, with the contract that the states entered into. It was specific, express grant of power, and that is delineated in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions written by Madison and Jefferson. Do you have any kind of statistics uh, about how many Irish did come in through that time period in the 19th century, and, and if there were any inducements for them to come over? I mean, besides the fact that, you know, there was this famine. I can't remember the exact amount. I believe it was in excess of a million. I'm not sure. What I do know is it continued for many years, and it was most interesting that even after the war, the what later became the White Star Line of J.P. Morgan continued to bring in the Irish Roman Catholics. Did that, was that involved at all? And I'm, I'm digressing for a second. I just out of curiosity, the White Star Line did it have anything to do with uh, the Titanic? Absolutely. <laughs> White Star same? Line owned the Titanic, Titanic and the Olympus. What a surprise! Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so what we're um, alluding to here is that uh, the European, European monarchies, the Vatican's, backed up by the Jesuit muscle, uh, forced an Irish immigration into the United States specifically to arm the Union Army to Correct. do two things, I would assume. One, um, uh, you know, cut deeply into the Protestant America, and two, to get rid of states' rights and to bring about a type of government, a federal government, which really, I mean, Eric, I don't know how you feel about it, but it, it's, it's about a state run as the Soviets. Correct. There's no difference. The, because the Jesuits run Russia, just like they run this country. So what they did was they set up a national government, because what we had was a federal or confederate right. republic of the United States. So they set up a national government after they decimated the Protestant South with its war of annihilation, remembering that both the radical Red Republicans and the Southern Democrat, the leadership of both parties, was controlled by the Jesuits. That includes Jefferson Davis, that includes Robert E. Lee, because Lee was a traitor, betraying his own troops at Gettysburg. So they controlled both sides, ensuring that the South would lose, and then instituted their horrible reconstruction, intending to completely destroy the Protestant South. Was there a time early on in the Civil War where it was thought that if uh, the Confederates had um, had struck, um, or at least followed through in their early victories, that they, they might actually have turned the tide early oh, in the sure. war? The, the first Manessas would have ended the war had uh, Jackson been allowed to pursue the enemy into Washington. All right, Jackson's not part of the program, so he gets off, doesn't he? He gets killed. And I just discovered that at his uh, death, at Chan when he was wounded at Chancellorsville, there happened to be a Confederate officer there in uniform that nobody recognized. So, no, Jackson had to be eliminated because he would have won. If he would have been at Gettysburg, it would have been a great victory, and then it would have been on to Washington. All right, now clear me up on this if you do have a deep background on that. Uh, Jackson was not shot dead and killed on the battlefield. They brought him back. Um, right, they brought him back. Wounded. 
and be wounded. They had to amputate his arm, and he caught infection, supposedly, and then died. Okay, and that's because he probably wasn't playing ball with the master plan, or at least didn't know that was going on. Right. The, the Irish really didn't. The Irish people didn't know what was going on. They were just doing what their priest told them to do. All right. So now, uh, as a result of this, um, the Civil War is fought. The Union wins. And what happens to 14th Amendment America that was different than before? Okay. Uh, the, the war is fought. The whole nation loses. Um, we are then reduced to the forced ratification of the 14th Amendment because remember that all the southern states were put under martial law. They were divided into five military districts mm -hmm. overseen by the cruelest of military commanders, including Butler the Beast in Louisiana. And until the states would ratify, they would remain under martial law. And so the last states to leave were Virginia in 1870 and Texas in 1870. And so when they ratified the 14th uh, Amendment and gave their ironclad oath to the federal government, then they uh, withdrew with their federal occupation. And with the 16th Amendment, what that did was this. The 14th, 14th Amendment. 14th, right. Okay. But the 14th Amendment, what it did was this. It reversed, quote, the origin and character of American citizenship, unquote, according to the words of the Supreme Court. And what it did was it made U.S. citizenship, quote, paramount and dominant, unquote, and it made state citizenship Sub, quote, subordinate and derivative, unquote. So it reversed it, and this is exactly what the Jesuits wanted to do. This was the whole purpose of the war, was to centralize power in Washington, conforming the government of the United States to be governed precisely as Vatican City government is being run, it's all centralized. And then in 1871, they incorporated Washington, D.C. Now, you could say, and I believe this to be true, it's not my idea, but I do agree with it, that what happened at that time was almost a dry run on a smaller scale for a federation which obviously uh, the Vatican is looking toward as our number of uh, New World Order types and groups uh, in, the, in the world yet to come, that, that doing that to the United States almost was a dry run by that's federating those states. That's correct. What they did, for example, to the state of Virginia in the, in the war when they divided it, created the illegal state of West Germany in 1863, because Virginia was a most Protestant Presbyterian Calvinist state. It was the keystone state. It was the state that made our country. Virginia had to be divided and conquered. What they did to Virginia in the 1860s, they did to Germany in the 1940s. All right. Um, now, we're past that point. Um, the United States as an experiment, as a constitutional republic, nothing like it before. Uh, now is, is, has been, as I would say, kneecap. It's been wounded. And, uh, and would you agree that it really never, ever has um, gotten close back to the prominence and the freedom with which people lived their lives prior to the Civil War? Correct. The, the Federal Republic of the United States was destroyed. It no longer exists. And on its ruins was created this, what I call in my book, the Pope's Holy Roman 14th Amendment American Empire. And with this Holy Roman 14th American Empire, it wasn't quite complete at the end of the war. They had to destroy the Indian nations. So from 1865 to 1895, the Jesuits, specifically Pierre de Schmidt, who was the most powerful Jesuit in the, in the plains at that time, uh, led and coached the Roman Catholic Philip Sheridan, the general of the army, uh, into the conquering and the subjugation of all the Indian tribes putting them on reservations after mass killing them. It was one of the Vatic's ethnic cleansings in North America. It was America's 30 years war here in North America. And it was General Sheridan, that Roman Catholic servant of Pierre de Schmidt, who said, quote, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, unquote. So that entire annihilation came from Rome. Uh, for people who are hearing you for the first time, as I had once upon a time years ago, it sounds very implausible. Your first reaction is, well, why didn't I hear about that in my history books? But, you know, we obviously well know on this show, and those listeners who do listen realize that those books have been sanitized. But you know what? When I look back, uh, and Harry and I have both, you know, delved back into uh, books that we might have read before, but it's uncanny how many times the Jesuits pop up. And you know what? They're spoken about almost in the same vein 
as we now talk about Islamist terrorists. They were a real pain. Correct. Correct. In fact, I just recently had something forwarded to me that a Jesuit community house in Austria has decided to give over the pistol that was used for the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914. We, the, and, and, yeah. and they had that weapon for many, many years until they recently gave it over this year to the Austrian Military Museum. You know, we did that last week, I believe. We talked about the Browning that they called, right. uh, that killed eight and a half million people, you know, obviously triggering World War I. Right. And, and the, the Jesuits said, oh, we just, uh, we just happened upon it, you know? Right. Right. Do you have any connection to, I forget what the, I don't know if it was a Serb, I'm assuming it was, who shot uh, Ferdinand, but was there any connection that you've ever come across between uh, that individual and the Jesuits? Well, um, I mean, hard evidence. Prinkip, Prinkip is, we're told that he did the shooting. But Prink, Prinkip was a Mason, so he was subject to the Jesuits there in uh, Sarajevo. But the guy who did the shooting was in the coach, and it was Potieric. He shot uh, the uh, Franz Ferdinand, and he shot his wife Sophie, Sophie in the growing. So oh, it was it, it, it was done inside the coach, just like the Kennedy assassination was done inside the limousine. Well, you know, we had Barry Chamish on your buddy a while ago. Did you have have you talked to Barry since you've been back, or out there, or anything no, like I that? No, I haven't. All right, well, Chamish, you know, r remember how Rabin was whacked? Right. All right, by a bodyguard throws him in the back. Right. Remember how Reagan was whacked? So even going back to the beginning of the 20th century, there's almost this little formula for how to assassinate uh, heads of state. That's right. Create a distraction, as was Hinckley, as was um, Sirhan Sirhan, right, Oswald, but get it done inside when no one's looking. That's right. Well, Reagan was shot inside the vehicle right. by the Secret Service agent Jerry Parr. Right. Not by Hinckley. And, and of course, Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy was not shot by Sirhan. He was shot by... Uh, a security that, guard or something, he, wasn't he? He was shot by um, Officer Thane Caesar, who had worked for Lockheed, which is a Jesuit corporation. <laughs> it never ends, does it? No. Uh, their, their plan is to always commit their executive actions up close. They do not shoot from a distance. And when the Jesuits made the JFK film, one of the conversations that Garrison's having with his guy, the guy says to him, there's never been an assassination of a chief executive with a rifle in 200 years. That's right, and there wasn't one here now either. It's always been done from the inside. Always done right. up close. <clears throat> and you always have to have a distraction and a patsy. Right. All right, uh, before we go any further, let's talk about Vatican Assassins, your book, and what is the present state of affairs with purchasing that or uh, checking out, you know, perhaps what you're about uh, for people who are uh, listening to you. Okay, uh, you can uh, check my website at uh, vaticanassassins.org. It's vaticanassassins.org, and... Uh, you can, um, the book will be available, I call it Vatican Assassins 3. Um, you may make that, you may pick that up uh, from Wisdom Books and Press at 1-877-280-2866. That's 1-877-280-2866. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. And you may uh, purchase that in about August or so because I'm adding the general index, which is going to go for about 25 pages at this time. Which makes me very happy. Yeah. <laughs> now the, the, well, my ex, my ex Jesuit editor worked on it for nearly three years, so it, it'll be perfect. I tell you, but you know what? It really is worth it because it, you know it automatically turns any book into a, a ready resource, and and they are key. I mean, you know, sometimes you just can't go you know front to back, right. and you have to hit on stuff. And you know, as yourself, when you're researching other works, I mean, you know, you got to go into the index and find out where the good stuff is. Well, it's going to be a CD. It's not going right. to be a book. So right. it's going to be searchable on the computer by Word if you want to search it that way, too. And also it's going to include the anti-Jesuit uh, 13 old books on them. That's going to be searchable, That's big. too. Yeah. Now, you don't have to know this, but are you going to have um, chapters as separate links, or can you actually go from page 1 to, you know, page you know 700 without a break? Yeah, well, that, yeah you can go. You can just zip down there. All right, so on that means your computer, however you want to do it, it'll be a research tool. All right, so that means that you can do a find find on this page, and you can go right on through. That's right. Which we we do with, with with obviously electronic sources that don't have indexes or indices. We can go ahead and do that. So that's good. So both ways you can skin it. Right, either way. All right, now uh, we we've, we've gone through the old, or the first large, Roman Catholic Vatican induced immigration. Before we talk about the one that's going on today, what is so bad about uh, illegal immigration 
uh, to any particular sovereign nation? Well, number one, illegal immigration is against the law by any country. And if the government is doing the job of that country, it is going to punish illegal immigration to whatever extent necessary it needs to be done. There is no country that I know of in the world that allows all this illegal immigration other than this country. So what illegal immigration does is it destroys the national identity of a country, and it creates all sorts of factions who then can be easily excited and agitated against each other, creating race wars, or whatever kind of agitation the Jesuits want to create, and then that in turn enables them to suspend the Constitution or suspend any sort of peaceful law that that nation might have and put in then an absolutist military dictatorship in the name of restoring order. And that's exactly what they have planned to do in this country. Do you believe that America was a melting pot? No. America was, it was a melting pot for white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Germans came, English came, French Huguenots came, Dutch came, Danes came, uh, and uh, the, the northern uh, Midwest and the Dakotas and the Minnesota and Wisconsin, they're all Swedes, Swedish Lutherans up there. Right. Um, so it was a melting pot for white peoples. It was not a melting pot for the black peoples. It was not a melting pot for Latinos. And it was not a melting pot for Orientals. That's only unique in the last 50 years after World War II when the Jesuits went on full bore to destroy this country. Well, the, the, the black immigration obviously was forced on them. Um, and that was also because of European slave trade. That's correct. Well, let's review that a little bit. Yeah, go ahead, do it. The, the slave trade had been raging all throughout the Dark Ages before the Reformation ever took place. So don't blame any Bible-believing white Protestant for that. Number two, the slave trade was conducted by the Vatican through um, its agents, most of them being Islamic, because the Vatican created Islam. Wherever Islam raises its bloody sword, the Vatican always benefits. So the greatest slave traders in the world at that time were the Muslims, the Muslim Arabs. And they have, and so for a black man to join the nation of Islam or the Muslim religion is insane, because they have been his greatest persecutors. The other of his greatest persecutors were the Roman Catholic shippers, the Jesuits, because they took the blacks of Africa and they brought them across the ocean into South America because the, the Incas and the, the natives of South America couldn't work so hard. So the idea was to bring the black blacks who were physically stronger, more muscular, to do the work. So the slave trade is raging. Slaves are, the labor in slaves is regarded as property. And the slave trade then is carried on in... Uh, in North America with the French, and they're brought into Louisiana and Florida area and St. Augustine and so on. Right. So the slave trade is flourishing. What happens when our country was founded in, in 1789, our founding fathers gave the slave trade 20 years to exist, and after that it was over. And Jefferson and all of our, many of our founding fathers wanted to do away with the slave trade and to repatriate the blacks back to Africa. That's why the nation of Liberia was created, and that's why Monrovia was founded, bought and paid for by white Presbyterians here in the United States. James Buchanan's brother, uh, Thomas Buchanan, was the first governor of Liberia. So it was the purpose of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants to undo this injustice and bring the black slaves back to Africa. And that was Lincoln's policy. That was the policy of Jefferson, Monroe, and Abraham Lincoln. But the Jesuits would not allow this. They had more plans for the blacks in this country to use them for the destruction of our country. Uh, what we're facing today, obviously, is um, rampant illegal immigration, which I have to tell you, Eric, in the Northeast, before I moved down to Florida, um, I, started, I started to see it like in the mid to late 80s, and I just thought it was a, you know, a freak of what was going on in New Jersey, per se. And then I realized it was going on everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, like, how did this happen? And I would even talk to some of them. Most of them were Guatemalans up in uh, the Northeast. And I said, how would you get here? And the guy smiled at me and said, you know, El Tren. He just took the train. And I'm wondering, how in the world could you do that? I mean, I had no idea that the borders were porous and actually deliberately bereft of Border Patrol 
to allow this to happen. And secondly, now we know for a fact that all this is being financed by, at least in the United States, the Carnegie Foundation. Correct. The Jesuits in control of the Council on Foreign Relations, which in turn controls the Carnegie Foundation and the Ford Foundation, finance this massive Roman Catholic immigration, because the Guatemalans are Roman Catholic. Right, so most they're, of Central they're, America. They're, yeah. they're bringing all of them up here into the north so they can further Catholicize and race mix with the whites. And the purpose then is to make America exactly like Cuba or Central America and South America, a mongrelized, miscegenated nation of peoples who have no history and will only be governed by military dictators. Now, with regard to the border, yes, it's the, it's the policy of the federal government to not permit the Border Patrol to do any arresting, to do any mm -hmm. shooting, to do any, any protecting of our borders, for which reason I encourage Texas and all the border states to secede. Washington is ruining this country, and the men of the states are going to have to do something about it, or it's going to be over in 50 years. Well, uh, <laughs> the thing is also, although um, you, know, you talk about miscegenation, which is race mixing, uh, I would also say that uh, the Latinos especially are pointedly wanting to not do that so that they can, as they say, at least their militant groups, uh, bronze the United States. Yeah, that's that's pretty much true. Um, the the Mexican men pretty much stay with themselves. There are a few though that marry white women, but the purpose of the Jesuits is to race mix the blacks and the whites, and that's why you see race mixing on 60% of the television, uh, so that the population becomes a nation of uh, half white, half black, and when you have that, you you have lost your history. You have no white history anymore. Because this people now is not white. This people is black. Mm -hmm. And they do not have any history. There's no history that I know of where any empire or any country has ever been established. It's a Republican form of government that was established by a nation of dual breeds or, or mestizos and mulattoes. It's never happened. And so this is the pet policy of the monarchs of Europe and the Jesuit order to forcefully miscegenate this culture. And the Jesuits allude to this in their movie Braveheart when the king uh, says in his council to his nobles, he says the problem with Scotland is there's too many Scots. Right. We must have Primanocta. And so that very principle is being used here against not only America, it's now being used against South Africa. Why couldn't South Africa be given half black, half white? No, it has to be all black and has to be miscegenated so that 500 white people are being killed every month in South Africa. Uh, same way with Rhodesia or Zimbabwe. There cannot be allowed to be a white nation on the face of the earth in 50 years. You know, this show was going to happen anyway, and I, I kind of put it to the forefront because I got an email from a listener who was very honest. Uh, whoever the individual is, the name is Nexus. And Nexus said, you know, I listened to mongrelization, and at first I was appalled and angered. And then after that faded away, I took a look at it. And I realized that, no, it wasn't necessarily a racist thing. Uh, it was just a statement of fact. And uh, Nexus asked me, uh, do you think whites are superior? And I'm saying, I'm not talking about superiority. What I'm saying is that the United States, call it a freak of nature or whatever, was founded by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. That's correct. That's just the way it was. That's correct. And I will go one step farther and say white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture is a higher culture than white Roman Catholic culture. And I can show you writers in the late 1800s and 1900s that proved it. I can show you writers that show the prisons were primarily occupied by Roman Catholics even though they were in the minority. So we have two things happening here. We have the majority in prison being blacks and Roman Catholics. And the Jesuits liked it to be that way because the blacks that are run through the prison system, as I understand it, it's something like one out of three males go to jail sometime in their life, the Jesuits in control of the prisons do their best to recruit them into the nation of Islam run by that high-level Freemason, Louis Farrakhan, who's nothing more than the slave of the Pope, advocating a white race war and ultimately a war against the Jews. Uh, also, I, I wrote to Nexus and I said, you know, it's you have to understand something. We've all been conditioned so that when whites talk about shall we say, white pride, or liking being white, or trying to defend ourselves, it's immediately knee-jerk reacted to by saying you're racist. And it's like, why? 
I mean, if, if, I, if I were to be black and say, you know, I like being black, that's okay. But if you say anything positively about your own race, being a white, that's seen as being immediately racist. That's correct. You are castigated, uh, hated, and denigrated. Uh, it's interesting that on the TV, and I've talked with this with some black Seventh-day Adventist friends of mine in Florida, I said it's very interesting to note that the television will never say black man rapes white woman or two blacks kill five or six white people. They will never report those conditions of fact. It's a fact of what the race is. Why not report it? Because they have to create the illusion that we're all under the equal amount of crime so as to justify the military police state they want to put upon us. Well, a listener who works for a um, PR firm that deals with a lot of think tanks uh, was appalled and had written me and said that they had to do a program um, dealing with um, adolescence and delinquency, but there could be no other race uh, shown uh, but white as being delinquent. So well, that's ridiculous. The 70% of all black children are born out of wedlock. They have no fathers. The fathers impregnate the women and then leave them, and they don't assume the responsibility to raise them. And so what happens is all of our inner cities are war zones with children that have grown into adults that know no discipline, that for the most part hate white people and commit white, black on white crime all the time. Why do you think we have white flight for the last 50 years? Why do white people in general move away from the blacks when the blacks move in their cultures? It's because the blacks don't respect private property, they're vicious, they're full of crime, and so the white people move away. I can show you that here in Harrisburg. In Harrisburg, you have the Black East Shore where the capital is, and the whites live on the other side of the river called the White West Shore, and you will find that in every major city in this country. Uh, I don't necessarily have any problem with any races, especially here in Florida. We've, you got your pick. Um, everything's all right. However... Unfortunately, there is a militant vein being raised up, especially among the Latinos. And, um, and then that gets to be problematic. But the problem is, Eric, is that they don't realize they're being used also. Um, and I'll speak to this, and you can tell me w your feelings about this particular, uh, organ uh, well, actually, conference. The Third Communist International talked about how nations w could be overthrown. For a nation like our own that, co that was called colonial because it had inside it nations unto themselves, you know, with, with blacks and whites. And they said that what you have to do is, is tear it down from inside. And to do that, you have to foment race uh, hatred. Race hatred. That's why they would not allow the blacks to go back to Africa. That's why they would not allow Marcus Garvey in the 30s to preach his black pride and try to get American uh, blacks to go back to uh, Africa. They trumped up charges against him for mail fraud and send him back to Jamaica. Now, the thing is, it doesn't make a difference whether someone doesn't know if they're being used. Because if you get into uh, a situation where you're going to have some, some hitting and shooting, uh, you got to take, you know, you have to react. you got to do something. So it doesn't really make a difference then whether or not you know that these people are just as unfortunate as you. But here's the one thing that does upset me to a certain extent, even though, again, like I said, they may not know. I'm going to play you a clip. Uh, I'm going to play two, but I'll play one first about what is taking place in uh, the Southwest, okay? Okay. All right, hang in there. The final speaker is Armando Navarro, professor of ethnic studies at the University of California, Riverside. He organized a conference of about 500 Latino activists pledged non-compliance with Prop 187. This conference was hosted by UC Riverside, Mecha. These are the critical years for us as a Latino community. We're in the state of transition, and that transformation is called the Browning of America. Latinos are now becoming the majority. Because I know the time and history is on the side of the Chicano Latino community. It is changing in the future and in the present the balance of power of this nation. It's a game, it's a game of power. Who controls it? You are like the generals that command armies. We're in a state of war. This Proposition 187 is a declaration of war against the Latino Chicano community of this country. They know the demographics. They know that history and time is on our side as one community, as one people, as one nation within a nation, as a community that we are, the Chicano Latino community of this nation. 
What this means is a transfer of power. It means control. Well, there you have it. I mean, that's not necessarily a, a mellow statement, is it? Well, that's, that's just more Jesuit activism, exciting their Roman Catholic slaves to further create agitation and revolution. And as I say, the end result of this is going to be a white Roman Catholic fascist neo-Nazi government that is going to come about because the white people in this country, because they're so stupid and they don't want to take five minutes out of their life to read any history and because they all, their purpose in life is to make money and to have pleasure, as a result of this, it's going to get so bad with the riots and the race war that's coming is that they're going to look to the federal government for the solution, and the solution is going to be fascism, exactly what was said in JFK's movie. And so you're going to have all these whites, Catholics and Protestants together, uniting against a common enemy, the Latinos and the blacks of the nation of Islam, and that's exactly what was done in the nation of Germany. The common enemy was the Jew and the white uh, Protestants of Germany and the Catholics united together against them. But the sad fact is also that you know, when all the dust settles, uh, Latinos, blacks, whites, and all others, Hindu, whatever, are all going to be under the same fascism that Orwell spoke about in 1984. Correct. Um, I'm going to play a second cup, and um, this is pretty upsetting. And, uh, again, it reflects the militant side of that movement, which I realize not all Latinos are involved in, but this is where it can go at its worst edge, and we're going to play the second cut, uh, Eric. We now hear Agustin Sabata, Information Minister of the Brown Berets, the foot soldiers of the Aslan movement. This was on July 4, 1996, at an Independence Day rally and celebration at the Federal Building in Westwood, where illegal aliens and the Communist Progressive Labor Party attacked Americans celebrating Independence Day. Agustin Sabata, the Brown Berets, we're here today to show L.A show the minority people here, the Anglo-Saxons, that we are here, the majority. We're here to stay. We do the work in this city. We take care of the spoiled brat children. We clean their offices. We pick the food. We do the manufacturing in the factories of L.A. We are the majority here, and we are not going to be pushed around. We're here in Westwood. This is the fourth time we've been here in the last two months to show white Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, L.A., the few of you who remain, that we are the majority, and we claim this land is ours, it's always been ours, and we're still here, and uh, none of this talk about deporting. If anybody's going to be deported, it's going to be you. Go back to Simi Valley, you skunks! Go back to Woodland Hills! Go back to Boston! Go back to the Plymouth Rock, you pilgrims! Get out! We are the future! You're old and tired! Go on! We have beaten you! Leave like beaten rats! You old white people, it is your duty to die! Even their own ethicists say that they should die. That they have a duty to die. They're taking up too much space, too much air. We are the majority in L.A. There's over 7 million Mexicans in L.A. County alone. We are the majority. And you're going to see every day more and more of it as we, we manifest, as our young people grow up, we graduate from high school, go on to college and start taking over the society. Our people are, the, the vast majority of our people are under the age of 15 years old. Right now we're already controlling those elections, whether it's through violence or nonviolence, through love of having children, we're going to take over. This is this is Mexico. They're the pilgrims on, on our land. Go back to the Minia, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. Well, that was rather refreshing, wasn't it, Eric? <laughs> in, uh, in attempting to be objective while listening to that diatribe, right. we have to give special attention to what he said. All you white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, I'd like to call to your remembrance that Los Angeles is a Catholic town. Los Angeles has been Catholic for decades. Right. Why doesn't he talk about the white Roman Catholics? Why doesn't he down the white Roman Catholics? Why only the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants of L.A. and California? Because it's a Jesuit agitation calculated to destroy the Reformation and this once great Reformed country with their Roman Catholic foreigners who have no right to be here, who are here illegally, and nobody's doing a thing about it. I have in front of me um, the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. 
and one of them I'm thinking about right now is the, uh, the redistribution of wealth. And really what we're seeing, and l- let me ask you this uh, in the time that we have left. Personally, I don't think Karl Mar- Marx thought up and wrote the manifesto of the Communist Party. Your feelings on that? No, Karl Marx was tutored to write that in the British Museum by Jesuits. He was a high-level 33rd degree Freemason who worked for the Jesuit order. Uh, Engels, who we never hear anything, was a British lord and also affiliated with the Jesuit order, and he wrote Das Kapital. So, no, that was... The, the Communist Manifesto was the, was the conclusion of what the Jesuits had perfected on their Paraguayan reductions from about 1600 to 1750. They perfected all the planks and implemented those planks on the reductions where there was 31 great populations in Brazil and encompassing roughly 200,000 Guarani Indians. I'm also wondering, um, I have a feeling that the Rothschilds were probably involved in that back when, as Zionists. Oh, sure. Uh, in fact, when I was in uh, was it Zikron in Israel just a couple months ago, uh, the Baron Rothschild had purchased that area, and it started that town. So no, the the uh, the Rothschilds, being the Vatican bankers, are all behind the Pope's Masonic Jewish Zionist movement. In fact, Napoleon was. Napoleon wanted to declare Palestine a homeland for the Jews, and we know Napoleon was a tool of the Jesuit order out of Corsica, where the Jesuits had been confined during their suppression. The other thing is also. Um what we're seeing now, and I'm getting a little bit off topic, but we, this goes back to what we were talking about in the first part of the show. You know, we think that the bad guys always have it down. They never have any arguments. There's some, um, I guess, uh, chatter out there to the extent that amongst the NWO, that there may be a split between the Zionists who more or less wag Western Europe and the United States. And, and to answer this, uh, Eurasia, meaning Russia, China, uh, let's see, and uh, eventually Iran and some of the uh, satellites that may be taken back into Russia are going to try to counter that. Now, first of all, do you think there may be a split there? And then how does the Vatican factor into what might be a dispute between the, uh, the boys? No, there is no dispute there. The Jesuits have ruled Russia since the Bolshevik Revolution, since the Jesuits were given formal reentry into Russia in 1922 after they had been expelled by Tsar Alexander I in 1820. Uh, the Jesuits run Red China since it was after, really since the overthrow of the uh, Manchu dynasty in 1912. And uh, the CIA put uh, Mao Zedong in power in 1949. So now the Jesuits rule all the communist bloc world. They rule the Muslim world. They rule Europe. And they rule it through their various and sundry secret societies, the Masonic Jewish Zionists being one of them, the Rothschild Illuminati Council of 300 being one of them, the, the Order of the Garter being another one of them. All these secret societies are tied together at the top in the person of the Jesuit order. And so they're rearranging things at this present moment with this war to destroy the enemies of the papacy, they being historic, what was once white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America, and the Muslim peoples. So therefore you think, um, or you believe, I'm not going to say you think, you believe that, um, let's say, the robber barons who have ensconced themselves in the United States now as the Illuminati on the uh, this side of the uh, ocean, Rockefeller, Ford, Carnegie, and the like, um, do you believe they're taking their marching orders from the Vatican? Absolutely. The Illuminati was founded in 1776 by a Jesuit named Adam Weishaupt, who right. never left the order. And he went into alliance with the House of Rothschild to finance the Napoleonic Wars. From there you can prove that the Rothschilds have been the bankers for the Vatican since that time, and it's never broken. So whatever the Rothschilds do, it's on orders from the Vatican. Because remember, the Jesuit order employs the, gro- the greatest assassins in the world. Nobody disobeys them that's in their pay. If they disobey, if the little old Rothschilds disobeyed, or the Warburgs, the Sassoons, or the Schiffs, or the Greenspans, if they disobeyed, they're, they're, they're gone. Because the Jesuits control the Pope's international in- intelligence community, which includes... The CIA, the KGB, the German BND, the Chinese Secret Service, the Mossad, the Pakistani ISI, all the intelligence agencies work together. So you don't think that, that China will try to bolt as a, uh, a rogue element? Never. China is completely under the iron fist of the Jesuit order because the Jesuits are using their military-industrial complex of America, 
Lockheed, Grumman, Boeing, and, and AIG to give high technology to the Chinese Navy and high Chinese Air Force, including torpedoes that go 240 miles an hour. That's all been given to Red China. The Jesuits would not give this technology to that government and that people if they were not in complete control of that government. Before we run out of time, Eric, um, again, how can people find out more about you and how can they at least position themselves to buy the CD when it is available? Okay, uh, you can um, check my website at www.vaticanassassins.org. And uh, if you'd like, you can purchase the book, Vatican Assassins, Wounded in the House of My Friends, which is a uh, history of the Jesuit order leading up to the assassination of our first Roman Catholic president, John F. Kennedy. And you may get uh, Vatican Assassins Three, which is with the third edition from Wisdom Books and Press. Uh, the telephone number is 1-877-280-2866. It's one eight seven seven two eight zero two eight six six, and you call it specific at uh, Pacific Standard Time, and the book will be available in August. It will be a CD actually, and then you can download the book from your CD. There will also be an attached CD with it that will have thirteen rare books on the Jesuit order that's very hard to find, including the Black Pope, written by M. F. Cousin. Uh This is not fair, but I'll do it anyway. We only have a couple of seconds. Uh, what do you see now? There's been a lot of chatter, as you know, about an attack that would abrogate uh, the elections in November. Uh, any feelings on that? I believe they're going to put George Bush in again. Um, but as far as an attack, as far as when, I don't know when to say. I do believe they're going to have another attack, and that attack may very well be the detonation of a few mini nukes as the Jesuits have seen. Schwarzenegger movie, Two Lies, and the other movie, a, with uh, Clancy's work on uh, And also all the some, yeah, some of all fears, some right? Some of all fears. So I look, because there's about 200 small nuclear weapons de uh, buried in this country all throughout the country. So the CIA can detonate them when they want to, blame it on Al-Qaeda, because the CIA is Al-Qaeda. That's right. And then justify doing whatever they want. Uh, sorry for blowing your eardrums out with the uh, outro music. But besides that, I think you got away unharmed. We thank you for being with us, and I know we'll talk to you soon. Welcome back to the USSA. My pleasure. Lord bless you, please. All right. Good night, and God bless you. Bye-bye.